So now we are talking with Dr. Margaret Landis, who is a postdoc at CU Boulder. She specializes in geology and icy bodies all over the solar system. She's worked with spacecraft like the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, the Dawn spacecraft that visited the dwarf planet Ceres, and now the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter at the Moon. Current work looks at the chemistry of ices on the moon and how they could be essential in determining what sort of water reservoirs our future human explorers could access for drinking and farming and fuel and things like that. So thank you so much for joining us, Margaret. Thanks everyone for, for having me. Yeah, for sure. So I thought we'd jump right in and learn a little bit about you offhand. So you, like I said, you've done a bit of work with ices all over the solar system. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the different bodies that you've looked at and what sort of interesting things we find there? Sure. So I've mostly been looking at um, especially water ice in the inner solar system. So anything closer to the sun than about Jupiter. Um, what I've kind of started my career in grad school on was looking at the polar layer deposits on Mars. And what's really intriguing about the polar layer deposits is that both um, between the North and South Pole, there are ice sheets that are about the same volume as the Greenland ice sheet. So a lot of water ice on Mars. Um, and they have this really interesting um, kind of bright and dark layers kind of embedded in the ice. And it's been thought since the 70s that this could be like the key to using an ice core on Mars, like the way we use an ice core on the Earth, where we can find so much about previous climate out from it. Um, we have not done that yet, so it's been kind of a long-term ongoing project, um, but there's things like data from the high-rise camera, so the high-resolution imaging science experiment camera on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that have um, definitely moved the field forward. Um, and so one of the things I did was look at the impact crater population for the North and South Polar layer deposits to understand how old at least the surface is because trying to come up with an absolutely calibrated age for the, these deposits, um, you have to start out with an absolute age somewhere. And at least the surface has impact craters, so that's a good place to start. Um, and then when I was in grad school, I also um, joined the Dawn team at uh, Ceres as a graduate student. Um, one thing that was really unique about Ceres, which is the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt and the first asteroid ever discovered, was that um, even before the Dawn mission arrived, there were lots of hints that there should be a lot of water ice. Um, the density was pretty low. Um, there were telescopic detections maybe of water vapor in an exosphere, so molecules that are just as likely to escape as like re-impact the surface. So we knew something was up with Ceres before we got there, and then when we got there, there were exposures of water ice on the surface. There were all sorts of landforms that rely on at least as we know the formation mechanism for rely on water ice to really form them. Um, we didn't re-detect an exosphere, which is um, interesting, but it's one of the things that is kind of still an open question in series is how does the sublimation processes work over time? Um, and especially because series has a global water ice table, like the source of the water ice, we know what it is and it's coming from the ground, uh, which is really helpful which is in contrast to the moon. Um, I started working with lunar data, especially from the Diviner Lunar Radiometer. So um, basically an infrared thermometer for the moon. Um, and one challenge with the moon is we actually don't know what, for sure what the source of lunar water is. Um, there are a couple of proposed sources like um, water that comes out as part of volcanic eruptions from the early lunar history, then was captured at the poles. Um, so there's locations at the poles that are permanently or persistently shadowed that get down to temperatures of um, much less than 100 Kelvin, so very, very cold, um, sometimes even less than that. And so we can trap water and other things that maybe were released from volcanic processes early on. Uh, but comets are also definitely a possible source. And what's unique with the moon is it doesn't have really an atmosphere, so particles from the solar wind can actually hit the surface of the moon and generate OH, which you know is most of a water that way. Um, and so it's also possible that some of the water may have come from that process. So there's um, a lot of mysteries, but I've mostly worked on the um, objects that are closer to the sun than Jupiter. Um, maybe one day I'll get to the outer solar system because there is ice everywhere in the solar system. Um, but for now, that's kind of what I've been working on. I love the idea that the sun is actually making ice. Like, that's pretty cool. <laughs> 
<laughs> in a very indirect kind of special case way. Um, but yeah, the especially for airless bodies like Ceres and the Moon, um, it's definitely interesting to see the role that solar radiation plays, um, especially on Ceres. So one, there's kind of two hypotheses for Ceres exosphere. One is it's just sublimation from water ice because there is a lot of water ice and it's at a temperature where it's not going to be protected from sublimation if it's exposed at the surface of Ceres. Um, or you could also potentially generate some water ice from the sputtering of solar energetic particles on the surface. Um, that's still, the jury's still out on that in part because where these processes have been demonstrated to be important are like icy satellites of Jupiter. So there, most of the surface is very icy. That's not quite the case at Ceres, but it's definitely possible that, yeah, part of Ceres' exosphere is also being generated by the by solar energetic particle events. So yeah, it's, it's interesting how much the sun matters when you don't have an atmosphere. Well, you know, it's, I feel like in a lot of these conversations about like planetary systems, the star plays such an important role. And, you know, to, before we kind of start talking about that, it's easy here on earth to just be like, oh yeah, the sun, you know, it's, fun. but then you look at it and you kind of realize, wow, everything is related to it somehow, which is obvious when you think about it. But before that, you're kind of like, huh. So in a lot of this talk about ice in, in astronomy, uh, there's this word that we hear a lot, which is volatile, or we could talk about volatiles as like this category of something. Can you tell, what does that mean? What is a volatile or what are volatiles? So to a planetary scientist and probably a chemist, um, volatiles are elements or molecules that are not stable to sublimation or um, lost to the gas phase at the temperature, like the ambient temperatures. Um, so what a volatile is will kind of change where you are in the solar system. Like for example, on Mercury. So, uh, so yeah, it's, it's one of the things where you can have volatiles like on Mercury that are uh, sulfur and other things. Whereas in the outer solar system and at Pluto, you can have um, nitrogen glaciers and then nitrogen is a major component of the Earth's atmosphere. So it's, it's very different kind of depending upon what your ambient temperatures are in the solar system. Um, and that's kind of the, the more rigorous technical definition. Um, what ends up happening is a lot of times planetary scientists will talk about volatiles as anything that is um, potentially going to be an ice at Earth, Mars, kind of inner solar system temperatures especially. And the reason we care so much is that um, a lot of things that are not stable close to the sun, like water, like a lot of organic compounds are essential for life as we know it. And so trying to understand where the Earth's water came from, was it always here, was it delivered from the outer solar system is a really big important question in planetary science we haven't answered. So part of it is the human exploration element where we might want to um, use these water resources and other planetary bodies for future exploration. But the other part of it links into these really big questions of where did life on the Earth come from? Because there's so many things that we'd consider volatiles and other planets that are so essential to life as we know it. So just to kind of like rephrase in like super layman's terms, and tell me if I'm getting this right. It sounds like generally volatiles are substances that don't like to stay solid, that they will uh, turn in like their lower energy state. They want to kind of be in this gaseous form in the solar system. Is that right? Or is that a misinterpretation? I think that's said. right. I think it's anthropomorphizing it a little bit, um, but right. well, and you know, we yeah, do that essentially, as a yeah. So the the energy required to do a phase change in these compounds is is low compared to the amount of energy you get close to the sun. Um, okay. And and yeah, so um, some great examples that I look at on the moon a lot are, of course, water. Um, sulfur to some extent because the stability temperature of sulfur is, of sulfur to um, one millimeter per billion years of sublimation in a vacuum is about 200 Kelvin. And so for reference, room temperature is about 270, 273. No, that's freezing. I'm off this morning. Anyway, um, but yeah, 273 is, is like freezing for water. So um, it's quite cold, but not like as cold as the outer solar system. Um, and I'm trying to think what else. So I look at sulfur, look at water. Um, one thing that's also really important actually is hydrogen cyanide because that's potentially present in comets and could be a tracer of cometary water. 
Um, and there's a lot of organics too um, that are important. So those, those are usually the kind of um, materials that are not going to be in solid form in the inner solar system for very long, depending upon the temperature. Awesome, thank you. So speaking of water on the moon, we have recently discovered that yes, there is a ton of water ice at the poles of the moon, um, which is pretty exciting just as the thing, but as far as like upcoming missions and sending people to the moon, what is it about this polar water ice deposits that scientists are so excited about? I think from a scientific perspective, what's unique about the polar ice on the moon is it could potentially preserve a long-term record of the water delivery to the earth moon system, which would answer one of those big questions I talked about earlier, which is what is the source of the earth's water? Um, did it come from melting rocks that were already part of the earth or did it come from comets that were delivered later? Um, and so I think from a science perspective, that's really why we wanna get at the quantity and composition of water ice on the moon. Um, from an engineering and mission operation standpoint, um, every kilogram you don't have to take with you is a kilogram saved, um, both in terms of, of money and um, change in velocity to break Earth orbit, but also maybe room for another science instrument or another person. Um, and so mass really matters in spacecraft missions and in human missions. And so there's this expectation that maybe astronauts um, could take a shovel out dig up some water ice and then have water both for um, human consumption, but potentially also for a uh, fuel source. So there's a lot of interest in trying to figure out um, the amount and the quantity and the purity of water ice, um, both on the Mars, uh, both on Mars and on the moon. Imagine having to harvest your ice, like that becomes a major season in your, in your life. Oh, we have to go harvest some ice. All right, kids, let's go harvest the ice. Uh, speaking of harvest, the moon is a really dusty place. Uh, and I imagine that these ice reserves are not exactly pristine. Are there any things that we need to watch out for or consider before we start watering our moon veggies with this stuff? Um, one thing I kind of touched on before is that there are a lot of potential. So if comets played a major role in delivering water ice to the moon, that means that other organic contaminants are most likely also in the water. Um, the one I mentioned earlier was hydrogen cyanide. That's real bad if you're a person. Um, and so there are some other complex organics, um, especially particular types of hydrocarbons that are not safe for humans to consume large amounts of. So that's kind of another probably multi-million dollar question is how pure is the water ice? How much distillation are you going to have to do? Are you going to have to bring a like basically a still with you to the moon to make sure that your water separates from other volatiles? Um, and then you mentioned how dusty the water ice is. So one thing that's kind of been interesting about looking at water ice on the moon is that there are data that suggests there's relatively pure water ice close to the surface of the moon, but there's other data sets like from neutron spectroscopy that suggests that the water ice most extensively is buried. And that's actually where your, your temperatures are gonna be the best. So you can kind of think of the lunar regolith like a space blanket. And the more lunar regolith or layers of space blanket you put down, the colder actually the temperature is below the surface. And so some of the best places to preserve water ice on the moon are actually not on the surface, but below the surface, which means that you're gonna have to either dig through regolith or um, dig up regolith that has kind of water entombed within it to be able to actually get at it. So um, that's a really good question. I think it's a, a research question too, because it's, it's not clear. Um, the other thing that can happen is you can bury water ice deposits when you have small um, objects called micrometeorites hit the surface of the, the moon. And it's a lot like a raindrop on the earth kind of moving the, the dust around it. Um, that can happen on the moon with micrometeorites. And if you do that for long enough and you have enough micrometeorites, which on the moon, there's no atmosphere, so you get plenty, you can actually move the regolith side to side and potentially bury things that way. So odds are that the water ice on the moon is not particularly pure. Um, but if it is, that also tells us something, which means it was delivered to the moon very rapidly and there wasn't time for kind of these regular layers to build up in it. So that's one way or another, we're gonna get a cool science answer, even if it's an answer of, yeah, there's gonna be a lot of challenges actually making it usable for human consumption. I have this picture in my brain of just like a couple of astronauts with like a pot boiling water like you do on top of a mountain 
I don't know why that just makes me laugh. Now, I did want to ask you though, you mentioned um, hydrocarbons that could be in there. And like from, from my outer solar system perspective, we think of hydrocarbons as things like methane and ethane and acetylene. Is that the kind of hydrocarbons we're finding on the moon too? Or is it something different? So this might be the extent of my lunar knowledge because I am a Martian and then uh, an asteroid person before I was a lunar person. Um, the, the issue with hydrocarbons is that there's probably going to be a very small volume fraction. Um, most comets are dirt and water and then smaller things. So probably these things are going to be trace amounts. Um, the really fun hydrocarbons like acetylene and methane are going to have a volatility temperature that's too low for them to be stable, even in some of the permanently shadowed regions of the moon. So odds are those won't be around, or if they are, they're going to be in very trace amounts. But there are some um, complex organic molecules that are kind of in that um, like 70, 70 to 80 Kelvin stability temperature range for the moon. Um, and those will most likely be there if the supply rate was significant enough. And that's kind of the other probably multi-million dollar question is that um, as soon as you get volatiles to an airless body, they start either um, being lost to space or being buried, or in the case of complex organic molecules being broken down because the, um, the lifetime of them when exposed to sunlight isn't necessarily as long as you'd expect, even if it's longer than on the earth. Um, and so one really big question is, was the supply rate of volatiles to the moon ever high enough to overcome these processes and leave a trace? Um, which is, we went and got an ice core from one of these permanently shadow regions on the moon, we could start answering some of these questions. Um, but, but yeah, it's definitely um, possible that there could be more interesting things in this uh, lunar ice. It's just that we don't necessarily have the data yet, I don't think, to be able to be 100% sure. Yet. Yeah, I mean, if you take an astronaut with a hand drill to the lunar ice and take a sample, that would be it. I would like that very much. That would be very fun from a research perspective. Um, the one thing though that I always keep thinking about is uh, I think the one really significant Apollo era injury to an astronaut was somebody during an Apollo mission trying to take a rock core and they had a manual drill um, and they ended up spraining their shoulder because the manual drill got stuck. And then what you do when something gets stuck is that you try to force it. Um, and apparently that astronaut ended up hurting himself. Um, a little bit. So it's one of those things where, you know, there are mine accidents on the earth still to this day, and this is an environment we can operate in pretty easily as humans. Um, so the challenges of being able to take that kind of technology to the moon are definitely many, um, but it's one of those things where there's a high science and high engineering mission payoff if we're able to do it. I never thought, you don't really think about that. What happens if the astronaut gets hurt on the moon? What do they do then? That's not something you think about. Really. I'm sure they think about it. I'm sure someone at human spaceflight at NASA is thinking about it quite a lot and probably it's keeping them up at night, but mostly me being a robotic spacecraft person, I'm like, can't you just turn it on and off or like switch the side of the computer and like make it work that way? Um, right. Usually uh, mission ending events for robotic spacecraft are like you run out of power, you run out of propellant or um, making sure the software works really well. And usually software, it's harder to injure software in space than a person, generally. Generally. That's kind of what's tricky about, uh, I think, space exploration in general is that robots tend to do a lot better of a job not dying than humans do in environments that aren't Earth. But obviously humans have a very real sense of exploration in this kind of like drive to go there ourselves you know, and so it's this interesting kind of balance between like, okay, well, we could probably design a robot that would do a better job than we would out there, you know, on the moon or at Mars or something. But there's something about being there as a human that makes it kind of more worth it to us or, you know, more real. Um, and so, yeah, that's an interesting uh, split. And I think it depends upon what your definition of better is too. Like if you want to take a global data set of images or of spectro uh, spectroscopic data, robots are great. Like here, here, here are the instruments, here are the computer commands, it's in an orbit, you can just kind of plug away at it. Right. Um, but one thing that, um, so I'm a, a physicist and astrophysicist by undergraduate training, but I was a planetary scientist for my PhD. Um, I did two different field schools during my PhD. 
And there's nothing like actually seeing your field site in person, walking around with a rock hammer, hitting rocks that look cool or weird or different. And that's one thing that's very difficult to program a robot to be able to do because um, usually humans can very quickly on the fly say, hey, that rock looks weird. Let's go look at it. Oh, it wasn't that cool. Let's go. But when like your communication time to Mars is on the order of like 20 minutes, um, then you kind of lose that real time geology ability. So I definitely don't think there's a substitute for sending a person with a rock hammer to do some of these things. Um, it's just that they're going to have a very different perspective and gather very different data than um, a robotic space mission would. So um, I still go to a conference where um, Harrison Schmidt comes occasionally. And what's really fun is to have him stand up in a lunar session and be like, so this is my field site. And we're all just like, sit down. I know, like, we all know you went to the moon. We're all amazingly jealous of you. Thank you for your insight. And he, he always has a very different insight than from like lunar reconnaissance orbiter camera images or scientists who've looked at the remote sensing data. So I think it's really important to be able to do both eventually. Um, but with remote sensing data, like you can have a global perspective you might not necessarily be able to have from um, human exploration alone. So I think there's a lot of um, synergy and overlap and it kind of depends upon, I know this is a very scientist question, their scientist response, right? Like a define better, what, like, what are your mission requirements and right. what exactly, what question are you trying to answer? And then depending upon what your question is, picking the right tool to be able to do it. Absolutely. I think that's one of the things that's really cool about this Artemis program is that we're kind of sending out both. We're going to send some robots first to check it out and then we can send some people to follow up and you know that sort of thing. Not something we get to do a lot as planetary scientists is have that human follow-up. Right and yet. it's close enough where you can get the data back pretty fast. Like that's yeah. that's the other thing um, from an operations standpoint where if something does go wrong or you do hurt an astronaut at least it's it's close. Um, I mean, not like driving down the street close, but in terms of the solar system, not too bad. Yeah. I heard a comparison once of, uh, you know, so I'm actually right after this interview, I'll be leaving for a three day backpacking trip. And I heard a, this comparison between backpacking and going to the moon that it takes three days, you know, to, to ship a person to the moon and, and three days to come back. And that, you know, we're not usually as humans like, used to being that far away from from somewhere but it is interesting that it is close enough that you can emulate that experience of being three days away by just taking into the woods and then you're like wow i'm three days away from from civilization but anyways that's a fun little aside yeah and the, the analogy of going camping comes up a surprising amount in lunar exploration because you, you do the same things like when you'd be preparing to go camping right Got to make sure you've got your food. Got to make sure that you've got your first aid kit because if you don't bring your first aid kit, you'll always get hurt, which is what I learned in my first couple field trips in grad school, just short ones that were for two or three days. Or if I didn't put Band-Aids in my pack, I was going to get hurt. Um, and then trying to think ahead to situations that might not be great, but that you can kind of deal with. But then also thinking about um, you can't literally bring everything with you, especially if you're backpacking, because some things are just too heavy. So yeah, I think it's a it's a good thought exercise to go through. Yeah, like how, how would you pack for the moon? Um, and trying to think about things in, that are challenging that way. At least you don't have to bring your own oxygen generally when you go camping. Um, though I, I spent way too much time at sea level throughout my life. So sometimes in Colorado, I'm always just like, why did I get out of shape all of a sudden? I'm like, no, there's like genuinely less oxygen up here. It's not, it's not me, it's, it's just chemistry and physics. <laughs> They keep uh, pure oxygen tanks at the Denver Center for the Performing Arts for dancers that will come on like a world on a national tour and they come to to Denver and they, you know, do their show and it's not uncommon for people to like literally pass out because there's not enough air for them to breathe. And they've just like totally, you know, done this extraneous exercise. Oh gosh. And dancers, um, for, for fun, I, I play violin and viola in like campus orchestra at CU. Um, and I always am in awe of dancers because they do so much physical work and they try to make it look, or, and they make it look so easy that I'm just always just like, yeah, you're, you are the stars of like the classical, like music and art scene. This is beyond me. Ballerinas are wild. I could never do this. It's an amazing, like just exercise in physics, the things that they do. It's fascinating. <laughs>
anyways, back to the moon. <laughs> Let's, um, I want to go back to this thing. I noticed you said it a couple times and pretty much everybody, every time we talk to people about the moon, they bring up this term lunar regolith. Not a common thing that most people are familiar with. Can you kind of define this regolith term and kind of why, why is it cool? Why, why do we care about regolith and what kind of things can we learn from lunar regolith? So regolith is a technical term. It's almost synonymous with soil, but my understanding is that the difficulty with saying soil or dirt is that it has this implication of um, biological processing, which we do not want to make that claim anywhere else in the solar system other than when we know it's definitely happening. Um, and so regolith is kind of the substitute term um, it's generated when solid rock breaks down into smaller particles um, over time. This is something that happens on the earth. It happens anywhere where your nice poor rock is not very well shielded from weathering, which is everywhere. Um, poor rocks. Um, but what ends up happening is you start breaking it down into smaller, smaller particles over time. Um, it can happen uh, like on Mars, you can have wind blowing it around and that will start breaking down the particles. On the moon, it's a lot of uh, micrometeorite bombardment. Um, one thing that is particularly special about the lunar regolith is it doesn't have really significant processing from water. So um, geology 101, you go into the field and you're like, oh, this is like a rounded particle. This is a angular particle. This is a subangular particle. Um, and those variety of particles, shapes and sizes come from, at least on the earth, processing from water. Um, that doesn't happen on the moon, so lunar regolith tends to have really sharp edges compared to regolith that we're used to on the Mar or on Mars or on the Earth. And that's actually um, one pretty significant challenge in spacesuit design and other things is that there's it's basically sharp glass that's hanging out on the surface of the moon, and it's potentially um, very hazardous both in terms of uh, making sure your spacesuit's resistant to it, but also making sure people don't inhale it. Um, because small glass particles in your lungs are not really why you want small glass-like particles in general. Um, so that's one of the really kind of tough challenges at the moon that you wouldn't have at Mars um, is the regolith. Um, and so, so yeah, the other kind of cool thing about regolith is depending upon its thermal properties, it can be really great at um, providing really cold subsurface temperatures like I mentioned earlier. Um, so what happens to these really small particles is that they're hard to pack together, which means it's harder to transfer heat. And if you don't have an atmosphere, then you don't have air pockets inside. And so you're basically relying on conduction instead of convection to transfer heat. And so you can really get cold temperatures if you put enough layers of lunar regolith down. Um, so it's one thing that you might be able to survive in places on the moon that are hotter than you'd expect um, if you could somehow maybe like insulate a habitat with lunar regolith. Um, and you might be able to put volatiles below the surface in places on the moon or on Ceres that um, kind of push a little bit more the limits of where they would be versus like stable on the surface by doing that. So yeah, regolith is just a very technical abiotic term for small bits of rock that have broken down to bigger bits of rock. I like the idea that it's such a good insulator. I, I went to a talk one time where someone was talking about uh, actually building habitats on Mars, but they were mentioning like basically using the, the soil and the dust to 3D print a habitat. And that would be, I feel like lunar regolith would be an excellent sort of thing to make a little habitat out. Make like a little, you know, dust igloo or something because it's such a good insulator. I, unfortunately, I'm not an engineer, so I don't understand that much about how exactly you 3D print it, but I've definitely heard that come up multiple times where you might be able to use the resources that are available to you as an astronaut um, in a lot of innovative ways. I think the one thing that as a scientist I kind of have a slight misgiving about is if you go to a place that's really special and you start digging up the dirt and you don't take notes, um, that makes me a little nervous occasionally. But it's one of those things where, um, especially going forward with human exploration, I think there is going to eventually be a balance struck between this, the science data we absolutely need versus the, the technical requirements of sending people somewhere. Um, it's going to be something that's very interesting to figure out. And I think the Artemis program is also bringing a lot of these issues to the forefront. Um, I don't have all the answers. I especially have a very strong science perspective on this. 
Um, but it's one of the things that's going to be, I think, particularly challenging and particularly interesting to see how um, these different needs for space flight kind of get balanced. I think that that also, you know, you could bring to the conversation uh, all the, the, you know, humans historically have kind of just made their environment whatever they want it to be uh, on Earth, right? That's kind of what our species does. And so I wonder if, if also there's, you know, a spot in the conversation for saying, okay, we recognize now that that has led to maybe consequences that we didn't intend to happen, but here they are. And so in the future, when we are exploring, you know, say moon or Mars or beyond, um, imagine beyond Mars, if we were, that'd be cool. Anyways, uh, you know, if we could say, okay, we need to think about a way to do this so that we don't just change the environment to what we want it to be. And then, it, you know, something unexpected happens or I, I appreciate that you're stopping there for a second to say, well, hold on, is there, you know, before we just start building igloos out of regolith, maybe we can pause and ask, okay, can we, do we, can we study this first? Is, should we leave it here? Are we gonna screw up the, you know, whatever, uh, I wanna say ecosystem, but whatever, you know, um, uh, system is going on here. So uh, yeah, interesting. Especially on the Earth, I I would even argue that humans have been notoriously bad at um, environmental engineering. Oh yeah, and like one of my favorite examples is um, we had gone on a field trip to Death Valley, a one of the resorts back in I think the 20s or 30s kept getting flooded, and they're like, "We'll just divert the floodplain. This is going to work." And so they um, took a drainage area that was, I think, a thousand square kilometers and changed it over to a channel that had been draining like hundreds of square kilometers. And all of a sudden their channel started, the, the channel they had diverted it to started washing out. And it's actually still washing out to this day. You can very clearly see where the particle size changes in the alluvial fan, which to the geology nerds out there, that's a clear indication something has happened in that system. Um, and potentially the worst part is it's now starting to undercut the highway that goes into Death Valley. So um, eventually the, the highway is going to collapse into this channel that has been um, expanding and migrating backwards because the, the erosion rates has changed so dramatically. So that's one thing I always keep in mind when we're like, oh, we're going to go build this on the moon. I'm like, yes, but also in Death Valley, which is a place with lots of oxygen. No one asked their friendly neighborhood geologist before this happened because it's it's one of those things where you learn in geomorphology 101 what controls channel size and drainage and everything. And um, somebody made a choice with some dynamite and it's still um, almost 100 years later causing very dramatic local effects. So that's, I think one thing that can also be the strength of planetary science is as a field, it's still relatively new. Um, my department that I got my PhD from at the Lunar and Planetary Lab at the University of Arizona was founded specifically to support the Apollo program. And so it's only been around since the 60s. Um, so planetary science itself is a very young field, still very interdisciplinary. And I think thinking through these questions and making sure we bring in folks with the right kind of expertise is going to be very interesting and exciting. Um, because like I mentioned earlier, we really want this data. And if humans can go get this data, this is going to potentially have a transformative impact on the field of planetary science, but we also want to not repeat some of the, the very exciting from a geolo experimental geology standpoint, but also very costly and very, um, maybe we shouldn't do this experiment again sort of situations on the earth. So um, yeah, it, it's gonna be really interesting to see how things shake out when people start arriving to places because they're gonna be things we didn't anticipate, but they're also things that are very, clearly obvious, like maybe not doing massive deforestation or maybe keeping in mind, at least on the earth, that sometimes they're, they're dry periods um, and there's complexity in the system that's difficult to model. But not to say it can't be modeled, it's just, you, there's always, yeah, you have to really understand how reliable your models are going to be and right. really think critically about them yeah. before you make irreversible decisions. Right. Right. Well, I mean, in that whole Death Valley example, that seems like a pretty big oversight, like a couple orders of magnitude in the volume of water that you're moving that you didn't account for. Like, that just seems like a really silly thing. But Well, and it's one of those things where it's so much easier for us to conceptualize when we can look at one Landsat image and go, oh, yeah, this is a terrible idea. Right. It's a little bit right. harder if you have to send a geologist out to go map it and then... True and do it manually 
and then somehow your resort's still flooding. And it's, it's one of the things where there's a lot of competing interests and it's, it's one of the things where their decision-making process made sense to them at the time, but right. even a, several years later, they were like, oh no, this is, mm, it did yeah. the wrong thing. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, being, I think, aware of your blind spots as a scientist or as an engineer or as um, like in planetary science, people come in from a wide variety of backgrounds like chemistry or physics or astronomy. Um, and so in, in increasing numbers biology, so really understanding what your limits are in your background, but also what you're very good at and understanding the um, same for folks on your team. So building really diverse teams in terms of experience and scientific background is really important. So we can um, at least work on kind of anticipating these issues before they occur. So it's, it's one of the things where I am by no means an expert in this, but it's one of the things I find particularly fascinating because I think we're gonna have to start thinking about it more and more and understanding what kind of data sets are important to drive those kind of decisions is something that's always, it's always interesting, especially when you're making them for a planet that's not the earth. Right. So uh, turning the, the conversation back towards, um, you know, the moon and things that aren't the earth, uh, you know, finding ice on bodies in the solar system is a lot more complicated than just taking pictures of ice caps and snow fields, um, especially when a lot of that ice uh, that we know of that we've been talking about is underground. So you can't see it from space directly. Uh, what are some of the other ways that we can, you know, kind of infer uh, the, the existence of ice, you know, that we can't directly see? That's a really good question. Um, and one of the things early on in my PhD, the reasons I picked the polar layer deposits to study is that they were on the surface of Mars and when they knew what, and we knew they were water ice. So it kind of reduced the complexity a little bit. Um, one thing that I think is really important to think about is looking at um, spectroscopic and geophysical data. Um, infrared spectroscopy, so generally with spectroscopy, you can assume you can have, you can detect water at the depth that's like, if it's light based or, radi or electromagnetic radiation based, you can assume that you can kind of understand it to depths that are about the wavelength of like the radiation you're using. So if it's infrared, it's some it's a certain wavelength. If it's um, near infrared or something that's shorter wavelength, it's pretty, it's proportionately shallower that you can kind of tell that there's water ice near the surface. Um, that's one of the reasons why neutron spectroscopy is so cool. So instead of using electromagnetic radiation, it uses um, galactic cosmic rays that generate neutrons in the subsurface and then looks at how those neutrons come up through the surface and how different energies of neutrons are um, released from the surface in different ratios. And so you can get at how much water is there because water is really great at attenuating neutrons. So kind of blocking neutrons from escaping. Um, unfortunately, chlorine is too. So it always just takes, takes some effort and some art to be able to process that data correctly. Um, but that's a great way of doing it. Um, another way is just measuring the, the density of an object. Um, like I mentioned for Ceres, we knew something was up because the density was much lower than it should have been if it had been purely rock. So that's one thing that's helpful. Um, radar also is a great instrument and a great way of doing that because the, the radar signal, um, depending upon its particular wavelength, can um, penetrate fairly deeply into some water ice or other regolith bodies. That's how we've actually discovered a large amount of the surface or near surface water ice on Mars is we've actually just taken a radar across it and gone, oh yeah, so there's layering here and the um, basically attenuation rate of the radar matches up really well with water or CO2 ice. So radar instruments are always very transformative. Um, trying to think what else is key for understanding um, buried ice. Um, another thing that's really helpful is if there are impact craters, um, they kind of scoop out an entire chunk of the regolith and you can actually expose the material that's below the surface. So um, my undergrad advisor always said that they're nature's drill or nature's um, soil profile trench because you uh, can dig a hole in the ground and you don't have to send anybody to go do it. It just happens because that's how the solar system works. Um, that's really helpful to look at. Uh, there's some really interesting work that's been coming out of the United States Geological Survey and the High Resolution Imaging Science Experiment that's actually looking at these cliffs on Mars that are exposing water ice. And so there are a lot of indirect ways. And then, of course, one of the 
tried and true ways, which isn't definitive, but very suggestive is looking at the geomorphology. So what the landforms actually look like, um, because they're very distinctive um, landforms that form either in the presence of ice or that have formed as the result of ice moving through an area. So like if you've been up to Rocky Mountain National Park ever in Colorado, they are spectacular U-shaped valleys. And so instead of being a really sharp cut into the rock, it's nice and broad. That is a dead ringer for something that has, that's been icy that has flowed through there. Um, and that is something that we um, kind of can observe that if ice isn't there anymore, you can still kind of say, well, this is like a dead ringer for something that probably happened with an icy process. And then you can go back with other remote sensing techniques and then kind of follow up in these areas or at least understand the path presence of ice. So that's one thing, um, especially on Mars, that's really important is that based on the data we have, it's very evident that Mars underwent some sort of massive climate change. Um, what the climate was before that massive climate change is still, I think, up for pretty a pretty contested debate, but it had to support channel formation, which usually requires a fair amount of water. Um, and then afterwards, something happened. Um, and a lot of that potentially thick atmosphere, a lot of that uh, potential water might have left the system. Um, so that's why uh, looking at geomorphology is really important because it clues you into major things that might have occurred. Um, it's one of the things that the MAVEN mission that um, the principal investigator of is at CU um, is trying to answer is how much atmospheric loss is happening in the present day because it's the geological adage that if you can understand the present day, that's the key to the past. Um, and so there's a lot of work trying to understand what those changes are. So it's not just ice that currently exists, it's also ice that could have existed based on other inferences from the geology um, that really can kind of clue you in, into these major climate changes, which living on the earth in the present day are very important to understand. Uh, and the better, in the more ways we can refine terrestrial models based on Martian results, the better our models will be for how serious climate change is on the earth. Um, I think most scientists agree it's pretty serious, but then we're also like, okay, so is it a bad day versus a very, very bad day? Um, and trying to understand that better is really important. And um, understanding Mars has large implications for understanding all terrestrial planets. Well said. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you is on this geology thread is, you know, people are like, oh, we're going to the moon. We better look for water and ice and things like that. And that's really important for living on the moon to have some water. But are there any ways that the moon's specific geology could be used to an advantage to living on the moon? So what I've heard a lot about is um, being able to use things like uh, caves or lava tubes to be able to actually like have habitat in or be able to go into. Um, a lot of the moon has a very clearly kind of distinctive volcanic origin. And so at least on the earth, you get a lot of lava tubes and little pockets inside uh, flows that you kind of hide out in that are caves. Um, that's consideration because of course, the more material you can put between you and incoming um, solar energetic particles or other sorts of ionizing radiation, that's not great if you want to keep your DNA all nice and neat. Um, are going to be attenuated by putting a large physical barrier between you and the other thing. Um, the other thing with lunar caves is we think that they would likely have a more temperate climate for, um, in terms of temperature for humans to be living in. Um, I think one of the challenges there is being able to identify them and actually getting data back. Um, the same issue happens on Mars where we see things that look like um, skylights into lava tubes, but course no one has actually driven into one or seen one they tend to be quite small and from orbit they're quite hard to identify because they're small compared to the footprint of the instrument but that's definitely something that's of general interest unfortunately it's outside of my wheelhouse because if it's not icy I'm like that this is also nice I can appreciate it but it doesn't have the same oh, I'm going to go read five papers about it necessarily um, but that's definitely possible the other thing I think that's really important from a lunar perspective is understanding the geochemistry. The, the current model for the formation of the moon is that a giant impact, probably an impact about the size of Mars, came in and hit the Earth, and the moon is kind of the, the remnant bits that kind of um, streamed off the Earth or potentially recondensed from um, a little baby nebula that the Earth turned, the original proto-Earth turned into. 
Um, and so really understanding the geochemistry of the moon kind of gives us some insight into what maybe the primordial chemistry of the earth was, um, which is always difficult because the earth, I mean, this is a very planetary science perspective, but the earth has been trashed by oceans and, and carbon-based life. And so there, it's, it's very hard to find very old geologic records of early earth on the earth. So it might be that the moon um, is a potential source of understanding really early um, terrestrial geochemistry. Of course, it's more complicated than that, um, but it's another reason why it's important to be interested in the moon. Even if you don't like, even if you're me and are, are very, like a very volatile centric person. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of exploration that I think still is worth doing and hasn't been done on the moon to kind of get at these questions. So on the other hand, where, you know, we have some of these uh, parts of the moon's geology that could be used to the advantage of astronauts, uh, we kind of talked about the, the regolith being dangerous uh, because of its sharpness. What are some other th parts of the moon's geology that could be hazardous to astronauts? Are there things that we should be avoiding as, you know, we kind of think, okay, let's go back to the moon, but don't put astronauts there because that would be bad? That's a good question. Um, and it's still a kind of lunar geology newbie. I'm probably gonna it miss some really obvious ones. But I think that the biggest thing to think about for other planets than the Earth in general is that most other planets don't have currently active tectonic systems. So I'm thinking of um, major fault lines and subduction zones. I grew up in Western Washington, so I'm like, yeah, there's a volcano that's generated from subduction over there. There's earthquakes all the time. Um, one of the islands off the coast where I grew up, half of it has sunk into the water because of an earthquake that happened in the 18th century that then sent a tsunami to Japan. So um, that by and large is probably not gonna be a huge risk on other planets. Um, most volcanic systems in the solar system other than on icy satellites and in the outer solar system, we don't think are particularly active. This is of course um, debatable, um, but it's not like we have seen eruptions of the volcanoes on Mars recently. Um, and most of the lava flows that we have dates for are, are millions of years-ish. Um, so that's probably not gonna be as obviously dangerous. Um, I think one of the things that's probably gonna be the biggest risk is that you lose your atmosphere and a lot of planets do not have current global magnetic fields. And that's really going to make it more difficult for the radiation element. Um, so in terms of natural hazards, other than like your usual, I tripped or, can you hear that leaf blower or whatever that just came on outside of my apartment? Perfect. Um, I don't know why they're mowing the lawn now. Um, what was I gonna say? Uh, so outside of like your usual geologic hazards like earthquakes and volcanoes, um, you could potentially have landslides. Those are always going to be occurring because if you have a, a slope that's steeper than the angle of repose, eventually that slope is going to go. Um, but other than your kind of garden variety geologic hazards or tripping and falling, that's another thing. Um, you're probably not going to have as much risk from that as you are going to have from the radiation environment. Um, and especially on the moon, the fact that if you lose environmental control, um, humans can live not very long without any oxygen. So um, I think those, if I had to like rank my risks, I'd be more concerned about uh, the lack of magnetic field and the lack of radiation protection than I would be from an earthquake. Um, but there are still small moon quakes. Um, this was something that I think came out of the Apollo results because they had a couple of seismic stations on the moon. Um, the InSight mission at Mars right now has measured a couple of Mars quakes. Um, they are potentially small and potentially driven by impact craters, so it might not be as um, active a system as the Earth. Um, but like we were talking about earlier, it's one of those things where we really got to nail these things down before we send people there. But in general, um, it's not going to be like moving to LA in terms of um, risk from earthquakes. Um, so at least in that respect, maybe living on the moon is safer than living in LA. Maybe in a lot of respects frankly. <laughs> Depends upon what kind of cities you like. Um, there will be other, fewer other people there, which, you know, before the pandemic, I would have been like, ooh, being by myself, that would have been nice as like my stereotypical introvert nerd self. And by month four, I'm just like, no, you gotta send a couple people along with you. Um, 
so yeah, and, and it's one of those things where thinking about risk is what risks are acceptable, which ones aren't, which level of risk is acceptable and which ones aren't. And, um, and it's still gonna be dangerous to go to the moon and it's still gonna be a lot of unanticipated risks, um, but it's, it's not gonna be, I mean, probably as bad as going out and driving around in a car. Um, a lot of, from what I've seen on the more science side, I have been to workshops and conferences where like human spaceflight from NASA has given presentations and they're doing a really rigorous job of thinking through a lot of different factors and a lot of different risk conditions. Um, and so with, with NASA's overall very kind of conservative now risk posture, especially with humans, they're, it seems like they're gonna do their due diligence. So I, I'm glad there, there's a nerd somewhere thinking about this. Um, well, I'm thinking about volatiles and other planets. They're trying to make sure that astronauts are going to be as safe as possible. Um, but that also comes back to, it's still going to be an experimental aircraft and experimental aircraft are hard. Like talking about lessons we've learned on the earth, it's never as easy as you think it's going to be, but you do everything you can to make it as safe as possible. Speaking as a complete non-expert about human space flight, I mean, like I've looked at this in the perspective of would I take a ticket if one was given to me, if like, NASA handed me a ticket and a rock hammer, would I take it? And I think at this point, absolutely. Um, but it, it, are there are a lot of things to be thinking about and a lot of things to be concerned about. So the more we can learn about the moon and Mars from a science perspective means that there's more data for folks who want to use it for human spaceflight or safety or mission assurance to be able to have access to that. Excellent. Well, that kind of wraps up the official questions that we had for you, but we also have our Capcom Q&A segment that we like to do where we have some questions yeah. that were submitted by the public that we want to throw at you. So these are always fun. The first one actually comes from uh, someone that I am very close with when I asked, hey, do you have any questions for about the moon for our experts? And his immediate response was, why do I want to live on the moon? That's a good question. Um, that is actually a really good question. I'm trying to I'm trying to think through my answer here, because for me, would I go to the moon with a rock hammer in a second? Absolutely. Would I like to come back to the Earth? Odds are pretty good. Um, there, there's. It's hard to have a hamburger on the moon. Like that's the thing is that there's there's creature comforts on the earth that are much more accessible than on the moon. Um, it's hard to get bubble tea on the moon yet. So it's one of those things where um, I would like to come back to the earth. It's also where my, my cat is and all of my friends and my family. Um, so coming back at this stage would be, would be nice. I think the appeal, at least for me in going to the moon is being able to go walk around my field site. Like that, that I think is the really major draw and the reason I would go in a heartbeat. If someone was like, here's a spacesuit and a ticket and like a rock hammer, have fun, you'll be back in a month. I'll be like, cool, cool, cool. I am out of here. See you back in a month. Um, someone can take care of my cat. This is awesome. Um, I think one of the things to think about is um, taking good care of the earth. Because one of the reasons you want to live on the moon is if the earth is totally trashed. Um, and that is, of course, like a very fraught thing. Like, who can actually afford to go move to the moon? Um, what does that mean for what we've done to the Earth? Does that mean that we've given up on trying to solve climate change and other things? So um, it's one thing that uh, Bruce Tchaikovsky, the director of science at LASP, always brings up, is it's easier to terraform the Earth than it is to terraform any other planet. So it's already pretty close to what we need it to be. We've just got to stop doing a couple things. Um, and so that's one thing to think about. So I think. Living on the moon as like part of field school, absolutely, it'll be fun. The reasons to go are you get to walk around your field site, you get to go see cool rocks, um, you get to see another world, which is one of the things I think is really valuable about going into the field as a planetary scientist is you can learn a lot about a place, but when you actually go there, there's something about being there and being able to collect the data in real time and walking around it that gives you a perspective you can't get otherwise. Um, living there long-term, I, I'm not sure how much would be appealing. It would kind of be like overwintering in Antarctica for multiple years. Like it would be very cool. It would be a lot of fun. There's definitely people who do it. Um, but to, to a general person, 
Um, the earth is a great place to live for fun. The moon might be a nice place to like visit every now and then. So that's what my answer would be, which is kind of like saying, maybe you don't actually want to live on the moon um, full time. Um, but yeah, it's, it's again, one of those things where it's, it's a cost benefit analysis. And sometimes like the earth has things that are nice. Um, but the moon do, does offer this, this ability to basically see and do something that no one else has been able to do before. And um, the ability to, to do science and to do exploration in real time, which would just be so much fun. So if anyone from NASA is listening, please, I would like to be an astronaut. <laughs> just throwing that out there, just in case. If people, hey, if people from, from NASA are listening who select astronauts to our podcast, I would be stoked. That would be so, cool. so. I would uh, do a podcast from the moon. I'm just saying. A view Get from the there. moon. <laughs> what? Oh, sorry. I'm zoom yep clayton from houston asks does the moon's orbit ever change slightly or is it very slowly moving towards us on an inevitable collision course so my understanding is the moon is actually slowly moving away from us um and the reason for that is kind of going back to the the ice skater analogy um for angular momentum in like physics 101 where the if the ice skater's arms are out it's a different kind of setup than um, if the ice skater's arms are in. And so what's happening with the moon is there is being energy transfer from the moon to actually the Earth's oceans through tides. Um, and so the moon, it, my understanding is it's slowly losing energy and eventually it's backing away from the Earth. So on one hand, it means probably not a catastrophic impact with the Earth, which as an impact person, I am both happy and sad about it at the same time because I, I like to live on the Earth, but a giant impact would be really cool. Um, the immediate downside is that eventually we won't get full solar eclipses anymore. Um, we're in, living in a kind of an interesting time where the, the angular distance in the sky of the moon and the sun are such that you can actually completely cover the sun with the moon um, in, in the right solar eclipse setup. And eventually that's gonna go away. So I think, yeah, I think that the biggest thing to worry about is living in a world without solar eclipses, which on one hand seems really simple, but on the other hand, isn't it wild that like our moon can exactly eclipse the sun? Like there's, there's something to be said about living in a very specific and very interesting kind of orbital configuration with your moon like that. Not all the planets have that. I actually just saw some pictures published like a week ago maybe of um, a solar eclipse from Mars where it's two little tiny moons went in front of the sun and it was like, oh, that's adorable. <laughs> How cute. They block a little bit. Yeah, so I, I probably should correct myself and say you can have a solar eclipse from basically anywhere with the moon that cover that will go over the sun, but like having a total solar eclipse is, is kind of a, is is a very unique thing and will eventually go away. Not not fast. Like I think we've still got, at least in our lifetimes, plenty of sol total solar eclipses, but it's one of those things where you just kind of go, oh, that's I better see as many as I can before I die slash they go away. Well, they're pretty powerful events. And I can't remember whether it ended or started a war between, it was, uh, it was between the Greeks and the Romans, I think, right? And there, you can, it's actually, we know exactly, it helped us know exactly when this moment in history was because they wrote down, the sun just turned black and the sky is dark and it's the middle of the day and we think it's the gods telling us to, you know, do or don't do whatever it is that we were going to do. And now we're like, hey, that happened exactly here because we can run time backwards with math and say, all right. Uh, but yeah, it's, you know, witnessing it is very like, oh my gosh, it's kind of like. Yeah. One of the most interesting science memoirs I ever read, and I need to find out more about this author, as far as I can tell, it was like a lady from Boston and she somehow decided she wanted to see a total solar eclipse. And she ended up going, I think, to three different potential solar eclipse observations. And I think the first two either got rained out or there was weather or they were trying to go see it and then World War I happened. And oh she no. saw a solar <laughs> that eclipse. That happens. Just this, this series of misadventures where she's just like, I just want to see a solar eclipse. And like, here's the travel log of how these things went wrong and we missed it this time. And she eventually saw one. But yeah, if there's not, it was at the beginning of the 20th century and there's not a lot of other information about her. I've been able to like find her in some like Daughters of the American Revolution records in Boston, but I don't know that much about her. So it's one of like my side projects whenever I have 
air quotes time um, to try to figure out exactly why she decided that she had to see a solar eclipse because it's one of those things where she it's my knowledge she's not an astronomer she's just a person who went these are really cool and I want to do this um so it was kind of a fun science memoir is it is a I think a lay person who was just like yeah I'm, this is cool and I want to go see it I think that's an excellent metaphor for science in general. It's like, I think this thing is really cool. Here's all the times that I've been stopped from actually observing this. Here's all the reasons why this went horribly wrong. And then World War I happened. <laughs> like, shoot. So a question that we got from Mick here in Boulder, he wants to know, do you have a personal favorite lunar conspiracy theory? Because there's a million of them out there. Do you have a favorite? Um, no. <laughs> and potentially for the following reason. Um, one thing that was really frustrating is the whole the lunar landings didn't happen. Because they, they did. Like, we've got rocks from there. So as a scientist, I'm just like, so then how did we get these rocks? large quantities of these rocks that have not been processed by like the normal processes that happen to meteorites. So um, that's always a thing. Um, we've still got, uh, like I mentioned before, Jack Schmidt still comes to scientific conferences and goes, here's my field site. Here's what I learned from going to the moon. Um, so I think it's particularly rude considering that uh, those astronauts were going in the 60s and 70s, uh, which means that they're they were relying on computers worse than our phones to be able to get safely to the moon and back, and they did it. So that is one heck of a risk. Um, the other thing that's kind of frustrating is that I am not a huge conspiracy theory person. And this goes back to like when I'd watch Arthur C. Clarke's Mysterious Universe on TV, where you'd always go, okay, so this is an extraordinary claim. Do we accept the extraordinary claim or do we look for alternative hypotheses? And I think the alternative hypothesis to a lot of moon conspiracies is it actually happened um, and we can pretty strongly demonstrate we can do it. Or for those of you at home who are listening who doubt the moon landing actually happened, if you are very good at lasers, the uh, retro reflectors that the Apollo astronauts left on the moon are still there. So you, if you're very good at lasers, you can bounce a laser off of it and see the signal come back. So there's a lot of compelling evidence, um, which sounds really boring. So I'm like, I don't, not really that into conspiracy theories. Um, I think one really important function of conspiracy theories, though, is you can start thinking through the, okay, so if we entertain this hypothesis, what data do we need to confirm it and what data do we need to refute it, which is what happens all the time in science. So I like conspiracies for the, the educational element of it, um, but I am much more into um, like Arthur C. Clarke Mysterious Universe. Um, is there actually an undiscovered great ape in the Pacific Northwest? how do we know versus not know versus um, something that so demonstrably did happen. And it happened not necessarily in our lifetimes, but in oral history and in recorded memory. And um, that a lot of people put a lot of really hard work into. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I always think of that um, video of Buzz Aldrin punching somebody in the face. He's like, you didn't go to the moon. And he's like, well, so as my uh, like 80 year old flyboy response to this, I will punch you. So, you know, um, so yeah, long story short, I don't have a favorite lunar conspiracy theory. I kind of get grumpy about them. I don't know much about them, um, but yeah, sometimes a great like cryptozoology one though, can I think illustrate the same scientific value potentially of at least entertaining me for a second and thinking about how to critique them. That's definitely the first place my brain goes when somebody says, well, what about this? This didn't happen. I'm like, let me think of all of the evidence that I can throw at you <laughs> to that's show the, you you're wrong. That's <laughs> the problem with conspiracy theorists is that it, evidence doesn't matter to them. That's the, like, that's the trouble is that they're not looking for evidence. They're looking for, you know, or they, they don't care about evidence that exists. They're looking for evidence that will support what they think and anything else is like, oh, well, that can be explained through some other, you know, these rocks were manufactured. They were 3D printed, you know, I don't know. And I think that's one thing that's really important, especially in this moment to think about with scientists, is we're both the hardest people to persuade and the easiest people to persuade. So if you present us with data, we'll be like, how did you do it? How many replications did you do? What were the lab conditions? Did you account for this? Did you account for that? Um, what is the precise measure? Like how much precision can you get from your instrumentation? How much precision can you get from your experimental design? 
But as soon as we go through that checklist and go, okay, this data is good, it makes sense, the interpretation fits with these other data sets, we got it. And then that's, it's very clear what will persuade us. And so in that respect, we're very easy to persuade. So if you do your due diligence and present your data in a really strong and compelling way, then science would be like, yeah, I was wrong, cool. Um, there might be like personal grudges involved or other like meta scientific things happening, but as a science community, we'll be like, yeah, that's, that's what we have. Um, it's one of the things where um, in serious science circles, evolution by natural selection is not really that debated. How it can happen in some cases, it needs more research, um, like Stephen Jay Gould's punctuated equilibrium idea, but dissent with modification, one of the predictions it made was DNA. We found DNA, so we're like, cool, that is like one heck of a confirmation. Um, and so I think that's one thing to kind of keep in mind, especially in the present moment, is that scientists have a very rigorous way about thinking of things. We can change our minds, but usually when we change our minds, it's through a very rigorous set of new data. Um, and it's one of the things that's one of the most frustrating things to me about the pandemic is people will say, well, three months ago, scientists thought this. And I'm like, yes, but in that three months, an unbelievable amount of lab hours and data crunching hours have gone into this. And I don't know any epidemiologists or um, infectious disease people personally, but I took a course from one in college. The amount of dedication and work that they put into understanding these things is so immense that um, I take by and large what the community consensus is very seriously. Even though I'm a physicist and occasionally will be like, I, I deal with things that are like more in some ways predictable than biology. Um, the biologists are working so hard right now and giving them credit for that is unbelievably important and, and listening when they come up with community consensus is really important. I think the bottom line is pretty much anything is, is more predictable than biology at this point. Other, I mean, other than evolution, like that's the thing is that new pathogens arise all the time. And it's only a matter of time between, path, between when pathogens jump from a um, animal host to a human host. Um, it's one of the things where I listened, before the pandemic, I listened to the entire back catalog of uh, this podcast called This Podcast Will Kill You. It's two PhDs in uh, disease ecology. And they're great to listen to because they break down diseases over time. They're very well referenced. Um, and seeing that kind of level of dedication for somebody who's a PhD student or a new PhD making this podcast in their spare time is amazing. Um, and they, yeah, it seems like one of the most predictable things is that there will be a new pathogen at some point, like evolution is still happening. Um, but yeah, it's one of those things where you got to get into like Monte Carlo statistical probability analysis. And sometimes I'm just like, well, what if I just say F equals MA and go from there? And that makes me feel better at night. Um, but the fun thing about biology is there's just infinite diversity and infinite combinations, and it's very fun to see how that plays out. Dip more difficult to model than some of the things I'm modeling, but still very cool to look at. I saw a fun question posed by a physicist uh, that was asking, what is the uh, mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell of physics? And I think most people responded with F equals MA. That was like the standard, like, this is, you know, <laughs> although that's more, I mean, that's true, but I think the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell is kind of the meme of biology, of cell biology. So I wonder what, what is the meme of, of classical physics? I have no idea. There's something to think about for, you know, if you figure it out, send us an email. Be like, hey. As equally famous as a line from the movie Mean Girls. Not mean girls. Sorry, say it again. Shoot. What's that? What's that Lindsay Lohan movie that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell from? It's a mean girls, right? Somebody help me out on this. I've honestly I never seen that movie. Yeah. I think I, I saw one. So like, this is wild. And there's like one calculus joke and one biology joke. And I'm like, I do enjoy those. Um, yeah, I don't think physics has as much of like the memifiable ideas. Maybe other than conservation laws, like those are really important. Um, unless you're doing some real wild high energy physics, generally you're not going to create or destroy matter or energy, generally. They, they should come back out at some point um, from your process. What about 
within our like physics department in our classes, there were always jokes about spherical cows. That's what I was gonna say just now, Terry. Spherical yeah. cows were the cows. Were the rage. Yep. Yep. <laughs> There's this bumper sticker you can get at Mauna Kea that's beware of spherical cows. Because it's the area around Mauna Kea is open grassland. Um and so occasionally cows will wander onto the road. And so you just gotta be careful coming down at night. Um, so yeah, there's there are occasionally these quirky ideas, but not as many that are like um, Tina Fey related movie ones. Yeah, fair. All right, well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Margaret Landis. Yeah, uh, thanks again, Colin and Tara for having me. And it was a lot of fun chatting with you all about the moon. <laughs>